Well, I'm, I'm not Donald Trump. Uh, and I'm not European either. But there is something common about Donald Trump and being an European these days, is that they both, Donald Trump and the majority of the European population, are aging. And aging is a real problem. You know, when you think that September 21st, the Japanese were commemorating the aged people day. And no less than 30,000 people were celebrated last week for completing 100 years. They joined another 31,000 that already have more than 100 years. That means Japan has the largest population of people over 100 years. But it doesn't stop there. One quarter of the Japanese population has more than 65. So does Europe. And by the year 2065, if all the projections continue to be the same, three quarters of the European population is going to be over 65. And three quarters of the Japanese population is going also to be over 65. So aging is a real issue. And there is only one way we can read from demographic tectonic shifts through history. When you have a demographic deficit, it can be provoked by people dying very early or because people are living longer. When you have a deficit of manpower, you normally have very important migration. This is something that you can look into history when more than 50 million Europeans moved from, the, from Europe to the Americas and elsewhere. You can associate it with growth because normally if countries have gone through a depression and they are in a period of takeoff, instead of people wanting to stay, you have part of the population that venture out. It happened after the Second World War, Marshall Plan, rates of growth were six, seven percent, and yet, you know, huge population got out of Europe to go to the Americas, to Australia, to New Zealand, to Canada. So there is nothing really strange about the current migratory trends that we are witnessing today. But it's something funny about how the discussion is taking place nowadays. That's why Mr. Trump comes so handy. It's very interesting to notice, for once, the migration trends are being associated with its security issues. And of course we know about terrorists and all the different Islamic, um, Islamophobia uh, arguments. But what is interesting to notice is that nobody really puts this into economic perspective that Africa that sits next to Europe actually does have a lot of people coming to Europe and that lot needs to be defined in exact percentage terms. And I'll tell you what the percentage is. For a country, for, sorry, for a, a continent with one billion people, about two million people migrate every year. That is exactly 0.2% of mobility outside the continent. And, you know, that's not the perspective that we have. We think that there is an invasion, a tidal wave, when in fact the deficit of just manpower in Europe requires much more than 2 million, requires much more than 10 million a year. So what is really happening? It's a perception issue. And the perception issue that is associated normally with Africa so often that it would be interesting for us just to mention a couple of facts. Like, for instance, Africa is certainly a continent that is coming to industrialization as a latecomer at a time where other regions of the world are already industrialized. And when you are benefiting from a latecomer advantage, you can do things differently. You can learn from the past. You are not going to industrialize the same way as Manchester did in the 19th century. So one of the advantages that we really have to pay attention to is how Africa can benefit from 
manpower from the fact that it has the youngest population in the world. It is such a young population that by 2040, it will be the largest workforce in the world. So how are we going to make sure that this is an advantage for everybody and not something that we have to perceive as negative is going to be really the most important discussion around the SDGs. Because make no mistake, the SDGs have a level of ambition that is really quite astounding. It says, leave no one behind. You know what that means? So we have no more poverty, no more diseases, no more anything. It's paradise over there. 17 goals that brings us to paradise. How are we going to implement it? If we look into who are the furthest behind, that's certainly Africa, right? So how do we transform this youthness of Africa and its potential in something that is actually going to change, not just Africa, is going to change the world because it has to compensate for the deficit, demographically speaking, of other parts of the planet. And this is not the perception that we normally have. We have a perception that it's a problem out there that has to be solved somewhere at a distance from those who are already developed with some sprinkling of policies that may make a change. And that is not going to happen that way. I call that the cappuccino approach. Because, you know, we continue to believe that the economy is the center of the universe. And if we have a very strong economy, we then can take care of some of the social benefits that come with a strong economy. And if we have solved most of the social problems, we have a very good social security system, then we can also sprinkle some environmental concerns. So it's like, you know, you have your coffee, which is the strongest part. You had some milk, which is your social, uh, or, or, or some uh, foam, and then you sprinkle some chocolate or cocoa at the top, which is your environment. The moment the problems start to appear, you first get rid of the cocoa or the chocolate, because you say that you have to fix first the social issues, unemployment, etc. And then the moment that doesn't work anymore, because the economy is shaking, you introduce austerity plans and so on, so you go back to your espresso. So how are we going to change this layered approach? This is basically what these 17 goals are supposed to achieve. But are we really making justice, trying to transform the way we think, the way we act, to really integrate these three layers in a way that is about humanizing and making the economy more sustainable? That's not quite my perception of what is happening right now. So going back to the aging, you know, a lot of people say productivity levels are for the first time stagnant. Technology has always introduced an element of adding productivity gains. And it's not happening right now. And a lot of people think it's because we are in the era of automation and robotization. So therefore, it is impossible now to count on human labor force as the main driver of productivity. You cannot acquire much more. You have not to replace humans with forms of automation that may create actually unemployment rather than more employment. This is a very partial view of the reality. Because in fact, what people don't realize is that throughout history, productivity has always been segmented in different parts of the world. The levels of productivity are the highest where the level of sophistication of the economy and the structures are also the highest. But that doesn't mean everybody is at that level. So you have to segment how you read productivity. And there is plenty of space for those who are not yet in the most sophisticated economies to benefit from low value end production. But they can only do, do that if there is a compact that is worldwide in terms of its size, and in terms of its reach. And the reason is very simple. In order to transform the reality of the poorest, you will need to have access to capital. You will need to have access to technology. You will need to benefit from this integrated approach that we have proclaimed, but we have some difficulties implementing. And there is one lesson that we have to, 
to give to all those who resist this type of vision, which is the vision that has been approved. And the lesson is to say, don't think that you are going to solve the problems of an aging society through robotization and through automation. For one simple reason, if there is any other, robots don't pay social security. Thank you.